Misconceptions series. Shout out, Jerem. We are on part six. We're going to do this religion section, and then I think, wait, let me scroll to remember. Uh, yes, a little bit of sports, and then we're going to stop when we get to history. So this video might be a little bit longer. So strap in and let's get to it. All right. First bullet point, the historical Buddha is not known to have been fat. The chubby monk, known as the Fat Buddha or Laughing Buddha in the West, is a 10th century Chinese Buddhist folk hero by the name of Budai. Um, okay. Did not know. Now you know. Next bullet point. Western sense, for example, Buddhism and Jainism do not have a creator god and Unitarian Universalism has no creed at all. Did, did we not read something about Unitarian Universalism recently? Huh? I don't remember. I feel like we did. Let's see here. Uh, this is what uh, Buddha looked like. Uh, Gautama Buddha, popularly known as the Buddha, was an ascetic, a religious leader and teacher who lived in ancient India. He is regarded as the father of the world religion of Buddhism and revered by Buddhists as an enlightened being. Yeah. There you go. This is... Okay, so this is Budai. Was a semi-historical Chinese monk who often identified with and venerated as Maitreya Buddha in John Buddhism. With the spread of John Buddhism, he became... He also came to be venerated in Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. All right lived around the 10th century. Well, a little bit chubbier. Non-theistic religions are traditions of thought within a religious context. Some others aligned with theism, others not, in which non-theism informs religious beliefs or practices. Okay, okay, and then it goes on to show that Buddhism they do not have, um, they do not have a creator god, and Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religion characterized by a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Unitarian Universalists assert no creed, but instead are unified by their shared search for spiritual growth, guided by a dynamic living tradition. Hey, if that works for you, that works for you. Just do whatever makes you feel happy. As long as it's not murder. Do not murder. That is not nice. I'm saying it in a joking fashion, but I am serious. Do not murder people. Okay? Alright. Cool. Alright, we're on to Christianity specifically now. First bullet point. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to click on all of these. You guys can click on the link in the description to come here if you want to go over every single one of these links. Alright, first bullet point. Jesus was most likely not born on any date corresponding to December 25, the date on which his birth is traditionally celebrated as Christmas. It is more likely that his birth was in either the season of spring or perhaps summer while December 25 in the Northern Hemisphere is at the beginning of winter. Also, although the common era ostensibly counts the years since his birth, it is unlikely that he was born in either AD 1 or 1 BC. As such a numbering system would imply, modern historians estimate a date closer to between 6 BC and 4 BC. Yeah, I've heard plenty of people say, Jesus 
wasn't actually born on December 25th. I feel like that's a thing that most people know at this point. No. But that's that's the date they have uh, ascribed to celebrating his birth. Moving on. Next bullet point. The Bible does not say that exactly three magi came to visit the baby Jesus, nor that they were kings or rode on camels, or that their names were Casper, Melchior, and Balthazar, nor what color their skin was. Three magi are inferred because three gifts are described, but the Bible says only that there was more than one. Still, artistic depictions of the nativity have almost always depicted three magi since the third century. The Bible only specifies an upper limit of two years for the interval between the birth and the visit, and artistic depictions and the closeness of the traditional dates of December 25 and January 6 encourage the popular assumption that the visit took place in the same season as the birth, but later traditions varied with the visit taken, taken as occurring up to two years later. The association of Magi with kings, a connection vehemently opposed by John Calvin as a ridiculous contrivance, <laughs> comes from attempts to tie Old Testament prophecies such as Psalm 72 and chapter 60 of the book of Isaiah to the Magi. Most accounts describe the Magi as being astrologers or magicians. That was a long one. I think this one would probably be important to see what exactly Psalm 72 is saying. Psalm 72 is the 72nd Psalm of the Book of Psalms. Okay. Good, good starting information there. Good starting information. Traditionally seen as being written by King Solomon. Its heading may be translated to or for Solomon. In the slightly different numbering system used in the Greek, Septuagint, uh, Jerem, and Latin Vulgate translations of the Bible. This psalm is Psalm 71. Wait, what's happening here? I feel like we're going all over the place. I'm going to click on it real quick. This psalm is Psalm 71. This psalm concludes Book 2 of the psalm. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm... <laughs> Misunderstanding something there, surely. Alright, let's keep going. The idea that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute before she met Jesus is not found in the Bible or in any of the other earliest Christian writings. The misconception likely arose due to a conflation between Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, who anoints Jesus' feet in John 11, verse 1 through 12 and the unnamed sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet in Luke 7, verse 36 through 50. Okay, so people just got confused. Just started saying, hey, Mary, you are a prostitute, a whore, a wench, a street walker. Remove yourself from the presses. Yeah, um, <laughs> what, what just happened? I don't know. Let's keep it going. Next bullet point. Paul the Apostle did not change his name from Saul. He was born a Jew with Roman citizenship inherited from his father, and thus carried both a Hebrew and a Greco-Roman name from birth, as mentioned by Luke in Acts 13 verse 9. Saul, who also was called Paul. Oh, well, again, there you go. A simple little bit of research um, would have uh, told people uh, the correct information. Right? There you go. Right. Next bullet point. The Roman Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception does not state that Jesus or his mother Mary was born to a virgin. Rather, it states that Mary was not in a state of original sin from the moment of her own conception. And original sin is the Christian doctrine that holds that humans, through the faith, through the fact of birth, inherit a tainted nature in need of regeneration.
participation and proclivity to sinful conduct. The biblical basis for the belief are generally found in Genesis 3, in a line in Psalm 51 verse 5, and in, a, and in Paul's epistle to the Romans 5 verses 12 through 21. Uh, okay. <laughs> hey, look, man, I don't know a bunch of super religious stuff. So if anybody is way more first in some of these things than I am, and you want to add a piece in the comments, then uh, feel free. Okay. I know a little bit, but that's exactly it. A little bit. Not a lot of it. A little bit. Okay, next bullet point. Roman Catholic dogma does not say that the Pope is either sinless or always infallible. Catholic dogma since 1870 does state that a dogmatic teaching contained in divine revelation that is promulgated by the Pope deliberately and under certain very specific circumstances, generally called ex cathedra, is free from error, although official invocation of papal infallibility, infallibility good grief is rare. <laughs> While most theologians state that the canonizations meet the requisites, Aside from that, most recent popes have finished their reign without a single invocation of infallibility. Otherwise, even when speaking in this official capacity, dogma does not hold that he is free from error. Yeah, I don't know if this <laughs> video is going to be a lot of people's cup of tea, because they're probably going to have to go through this all over and then do a lot more research and all that stuff. But, uh, hey, hey, it's all, it's all here if you want it, right? Um, papal infallibility is a dogma of the Roman Catholic Church, which states that in virtue of the promise of Jesus to Peter, the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, is preserved from the possibility of error on doctrine initially given to the apostolic church scripture and tradition and there's more that we're not even gonna, <laughs> gonna even get into but uh hey um there there you go all right next bullet point saint B peter's basilica is not the mother church of roman catholicism nor is it the official seat of the pope these equivalent distinctions belong to arc basilica of saint john lateran which is located in Rome outside of Vatican City, but over which the Vatican has extraterritorial ju du extraterritorial jurisdiction. <laughs> this also means that St. Peter's is not a cathedral in the literal sense of that word. St. Peter's is, however, used as the principal church for many papal functions. Uh, okay. As you all can see, I do not have a lot to say about some of these. <laughs> I just don't. Alright, next one. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints no longer practice polygamy. Currently, the LDS Church excommunicates any members who practice polygamy within the organization. However, some Mormon fundamentalist sects still practice polygamy within their groups. For more details on the subject, see Mormonism and polygamy. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Those uh, Mormons are uh, getting down. <laughs> hey, as long as everybody involved is okay with it. I don't know, man. Hey, you know what? Leave me out of this. <laughs> Alright. Last bullet point under Christianity. St. Augustine did not say God people. He actually said, I do not give the answer that someone is said to have given, evading by joke the force of the objection. He was preparing hell for those who pry into such deep subjects. I do not answer in this way. I would rather respond, I do not know, concerning what I do not know, than say something for which a man inquiring about such profound matters is laughed at the one giving a false answer is praised. So Augustine is saying that he would not 
say this and that he does not know the answer to the question. Okay, so yeah, he's like, look man, when I don't know, I say I don't know. I'm not going to say, because there's people who are going to hell. Why would I say that? that? I didn't say that. Fair. Fair. Yeah, say I don't know when you don't know. Don't just make something up, guys. That's just goes across the board. Not just religion stuff. Just, if you don't know, you don't know. And it's okay that you don't know. I don't know a lot of things. Ask Clarice. I say I don't know like one billion times every video. <laughs> so, Alright, now we're on to Islam. First bullet point. Most Muslim women do not wear a burqa which covers the body, head, and face with a mesh grill to see through. Many Muslim women cover their hair and face, excluding the eyes, with a niqab, or just their hair with a hijab. However, there are Muslim women who wear neither face nor head coverings of any kind. Yes? That's, that's true. I've seen Muslim women on the internet without any face or head coverings, or just covering their hair, or just their face exposed. Well, you can see pictures right here. These are the burqas, and the cops, and the jobs. Okay, next bullet point. A fatwa is a non-binding legal opinion issued by an Islamic scholar under Islamic law. It is therefore commonplace for a fatwa from different authors to disagree. The misconception that it is a death sentence stems from a fatwa issued by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini of Iran in 1989, where he said that the author, Salman Rushdie, had earned a death sentence for blasphemy. Uh, look man, I have no idea what's going on here. A fatwa is a non-binding legal opinion on a point of Islamic law, Sharia, given by a qualified jurist in response to a question posed by a private individual, judge, or government. A jurist issuing fatwas is called a mufti, and the act of issuing fatwas is called ifta. Okay, fatwas have played an important role over, hey, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's keep going. Next bullet point. The word jihad does not always mean holy war. Literally, the word in Arabic means struggle. While there is such a thing as jihad bil saif, or jihad by the sword, many modern Islamic scholars usually say that it implies an effort or struggle of a spiritual kind. Scholar Louis Safi asserts that misconceptions and misunderstandings regarding the nature of war and peace in Islam are widespread in both the Muslim societies and the West as much following 9-11 as before. Yeah. Hey. Muslim people are not bad. Islamic people are not bad. Okay? Be kind to everyone. Alright? Because if people... You know what? Let's just keep going. Just be kind, okay? Next bullet point. Last one in this subheading. The Quran does not promise martyrs 72 virgins in heaven. It does mention virgin female companions, ori, to all people, martyr or not, in heaven, but no number is specified. The source for the 72 virgins is a hadith in Sunan al Tirmidhi by Imam Dermidi. Hadiths are said are sayings and acts of the Prophet Muhammad as reported by others, and as such they are not part of the Quran itself. Muslims are not meant to necessarily believe all hadiths, and that applies particularly to those hadiths that are weakly sourced, such as this one. Furthermore, the correct translation of this particular hadith is a matter of debate. Well, uh, there you have it. Uh, you're not promised specifically 72 virgins. Boom, bang, bang. Alright, now we are on Judaism. Okay. First bullet point. The forbidden fruit mentioned in the book of Genesis. 
Genesis is never identified as an apple, as widely depicted in Western art. The original Hebrew text texts mention only tree and fruit. Early Latin translations use the word molly, which can mean either evil or apple. In early Germanic languages, the word apple and its cognates usually simply mean meant fruit. German and French artists commonly depict a fruit as an apple from the 12th century onwards in John Milton's Areopagitica. Areopagitica from 1644 explicitly mentions the fruit as an apple. Jewish scholars have suggested that the fruit could have been a grape, a fig, an apricot, or an etrog. What's an etrog? Etrog is a yellow citron citrus medica used by Jews during the week-long holiday of Sukkot as one of the four species together with Lulav, Adas, and Arava. The Itrog is taken in hand and held or waved during specific portions of the holiday prayers. Okay, cool. All right. Last bullet point under the head. While tattoos are forbidden by the book of Leviticus, Jews with tattoos are not barred from being buried in a Jewish cemetery, just as survivors of other prohibitions are not barred. Okay, that's cool. And we move from religion to sports. And the reason we're doing that is because what is the overall heading for this, um, section that we're in here. I'm going to scroll all the way back up. Uh, arts and culture. We're under the arts and culture heading. All of these things have to do with arts and culture. So that's why sports are here because after arts and culture comes history. And history is going to be another video. Okay. Sports. First bullet point. Abner Doubleday did not invent baseball, nor did it originate from Cooperstown, New York. It is believed to have evolved from other bat and ball games such as cricket and rounders and first took its modern form in New York City. Okay, so somebody saw baseball, changed it up a little bit. Not baseball, but saw cricket and rounders. I don't know what rounders is, I don't know what cricket is. Rounders is a bat and ball game played between two teams. Rounders is a striking and fielding team game that involves hitting a small, hard leather cased ball with a rounded and wooden plastic or metal bat. The players score by running around the four bases on the field. That's baseball. <laughs> what? That sounds just like baseball. Uh, but yeah. You see something, you change a little bit and uh, make it your own. Cricket is a bat and ball game played between two teams of 11 players, each on a field at the center of which is a 22 yard with a wicket at each end, each comprising two bales balanced on three stumps. The game proceeds when a player on the fielding team called the bowler basically pitches the ball and they try to hit it and all that. Yep. Okay, let's keep it going. Next bullet point. The black belt in martial arts does not necessarily indicate expert level or mastery. It was introduced for judo in the 1880s to indicate competency at all of the basic techniques of the sport. Promotion beyond first dan. The first black belt rank varies among different martial arts. In judo and derived martial arts such as Brazilian jiu-jitsu, holders of higher master ranks are awarded alternating red and white panels, and the highest grandmasters wear solid red belts. Some other arts such as taekwondo use black belts with a number of gold bars to indicate the holder's Dan rank. Did I say Don earlier? I don't know if it's supposed to be pronounced Dan or Don. I don't. The Dan ranking system is used by many Japanese, Okinawan, Korean, and other material art organizations to indicate the level of a person's ability within a given system. Okay. I once heard a story that 
black belts came to be because everybody started with a white belt and the more you trained, the dirtier your belt got and yada, yada, yada. Like, you just didn't wash your belt back then. I mean, okay, but whatever. <laughs> also, I just heard a neighbor saying, hey, here, kitty, kitty. At least that's what it sounded like. I think it's that person who loses their cat all the time. I think I mentioned that in a previous video. Anyway, next bullet point. The use of triangular corner flags in English football is not a privilege reserved for those teams that have won a an FA Cup in the past, as depicted in the scene in the film Twin Town. Oh, whoops. The Football Association's rules are silent on the subject, and often the decision over what shape flag to use has been up to the individual clubs and groundskeepers. Look, man, I have no idea what is being spoken of in this one. So, if you are if you are a big footballer, then hey, you might know what's happening here. I am not. So, um, I no clue. No clue. Okay. Last bullet point for this video. We did it. And then history comes up in a future video. India did not withdraw from the 1950 FIFA World Cup because their squad played barefoot, which was against FIFA regulations. In reality, India withdrew because the country's managing body, the All India Football Federation, was insufficiently prepared for the team's participation and gave various reasons for withdrawing, including a lack of funding and prioritizing the Olympics. The AIFF itself may have been the source of this myth. Ah, uh, so they're just making stuff up of why they had to withdraw. Hey, look, doesn't matter to me because, again, I don't know a lot about football, so forgive me. Yeah, or don't. Doesn't matter. I don't know. Anyway, that is it for this video. I appreciate you all. Hope everybody is doing well. And thank you so much for watching and for listening.